for the purpose of ensuring the resolute, full, and faithful implementation of the policy of one country, two citizens, and which the people of Hong Kong administer Hong Kong with a high degree of autonomy. One country, two citizens is a complete concept. One country is the precondition for two systems. Two systems is subordinate to and deprived from one country. Only when one country is safe and secure can two systems be safeguarded. What is the meaning of one country? One country not only embodies China's resumption of the exercise of sovereignty over Hong Kong, it also means that a central government has a comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong. As in all countries, central government is responsible for upholding national security. Through Article 23 of Basic Law, the central government of China authorizes Hong Kong SAR to enact laws on safeguarding national security. This authorization, however, does not change the nature that such legislative power belongs ultimately to the central government. Nor does it prevent the central government from establishing a legal framework and enforcement mechanism of safeguarding national security in Hong Kong SAR. In response to the activities that challenge and harm one country, two systems, the national security law was enacted to safeguard the authority of one country for the purpose of upholding and improving rather than changing one country, two systems. Question three, will the law impair the high degree of autonomy in SAR or the rights and freedom of Hong Kong people? The answer is again a definite no. National security law fully integrates the comprehensive jurisdiction of the central government and the high degree of autonomy enjoined by Hong Kong ICR. It does not alter the current capitalist system in Hong Kong. It does not change the high degree of autonomy and legal system in the SAR. It does not affect Hong Kong's administrative, legislative, or independent judicial power, including that of final adjudication. This law clearly stipulates Human rights should be respected and protected in safeguarding national security in Hong Kong. The rights and freedoms, including the freedom of speech, of the press, of publication, of association, of assembly, of procession, and of demonstration, which the residents of the region enjoined under the basic law and the provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights as applied to Hong Kong should be protected in accordance with the law. This law outlined four types of criminal activities that jeopardize national security. They are secession, subversion, terrorist activities, and collusion with a foreign country or with external elements to endanger national security. The law targets a very few criminals, but protects the great majority of Hong Kong people. That is why in only eight days, nearly three million Hong Kong people signed the petition in support of the law. This bears full witness to the overwhelming aspiration of Hong Kong people for stability and security. 
Question four, has China failed to fulfill its international obligations by enacting the national security law? My answer again is a definite no. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. China was the first country to put its signature on the UN Charter. China is now a member of more than 100 intergovernmental international organizations and signed over 500 multilateral treaties. China has been committed to upholding international law and the basic norms governing international relations. It has faithfully fulfilled its international obligations and responsibilities. It has never withdrawn from international organizations or treaties, nor does it believe in us first at the expense of others. This label is more suited to some other countries. It is completely wrong to confuse the Sino-British Joint Declaration with one country, two systems, and accuse China of failing to honor its international obligations. The copyright of one country, two systems belongs to Deng Xiaoping. The Chinese government governs Hong Kong as they are in accordance with the constitution of China and the basic law, not the joint declaration. The policies of one country, two systems of the Chinese government are fully embodied in the basic law and faithfully implemented. There's no such a question that China failed to fulfill its international obligations. Let me turn to the fifth question. Who has failed to fulfill its international obligations and who has a trample on the norms governing international relations? Sovereign equality and non-interference in each other's country's internal affairs are fundamental principles of international law and the basic norms governing international relations. China has never interfered in the internal affairs of other countries, including the UK. And we hope the UK will also abide by this principle. The UK side knows well that Hong Kong is no longer under its colonial rule and that Hong Kong has returned to China and is now part of China. UK has no sovereignty to restriction or right of supervision over Hong Kong after handover. However, the UK government keeps making irresponsible remarks on Hong Kong affairs through its so-called six monthly report on Hong Kong, make unwarranted accusations against the national security law for Hong Kong SAR, and even talks about changing the arrangement for British national overseas passport holders in Hong Kong. These moves constitute a gross interference in China's internal affairs and openly trample on the basic norms governing international relations. The Chinese side has lost solemn representation to the UK side to express its grave concern and the strong opposition. I want to emphasize that Hong Kong is a part of China. Hong Kong affairs are China's internal affairs and brook no external interference. One important task of the national security law for Hong Kong SAR is to prevent, suppress, and punish collusion with a foreign country or with external elements to endanger national security. No one should underestimate the firm determination of China to safeguard its sovereignty, security, and development interests. 
attempts to disrupt or obstruct the implementation of the national security law for Hong Kong SAR will be met with the strong opposition of 1.4 billion Chinese people. All these attempts are doomed to failure. Law is the beginning of order. The national security law is the fundamental solution that will end the chaos and restore order in Hong Kong. I'm confident that under the strong leadership of the central government of China, and with the concerted efforts of all the Chinese people, including Hong Kong compatriots, and with the strong safeguards of the national security law, Hong Kong will become a safer, better, and a more prosperous place. Thank you. Now I'd like to take your questions. Now the floor is open for questions. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Liu. Uh, may I invite um, uh, Paul Barber from CGTN to ask the first question, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, China says that it reserves the right to take corresponding uh, measures to the UK's decision to offer a path to citizenship for up to 3 million Hong Kong residents. Can you give us any more details about what those measures will be and when they'll be announced? Uh, secondly, if I may, Boris Johnson says that he is still a Sinophile, but that the national security law for Hong Kong is a clear uh, and serious breach of the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Uh, how do you think relations between China and the UK can be saved from deteriorating any further? I think I already answered your question through my opening remarks. Uh, with regard to BNA, uh, you, have, you know, with regard to specific moves, you have to ask the British government what they are going to, uh, going to do next. And um, uh, I, I, I also said that uh, the uh, relationship between uh, China and UK, or between any countries, has to be based on uh, the uh, uh, international law and the norms governing international relations. Um, you know, the, the fundamental principles uh, of international law is uh, uh, sovereign equality and non-interference in each other's internal affairs. It was included, incorporated in UN Charter. It is also included in the uh, joint communique of establishing diplomatic relations between China and UK about uh, uh, 40 years ago. Uh, you know, uh, uh, this is the basic norms of the relationship. Uh, you know, um, this year is the uh, uh, 70 years since uh, UK recognized new China. In the past 70 years, we've seen ups and downs in the relationship, uh, but on the whole, relationship move forward. Um, the reason why we have a dance is that because these principles was violated. You know, when we have ups of the relationship, means this relation, these principles are, are, are abide by. So, uh, when the relation, when the principles are, 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 uh, abide by, uh, um, you know, we we would see the. Uh, lips and bounds of the relationship. But when these principles are violated, uh, the relationship will suffer setbacks and even retrogression. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, Eleanor Smallwood from BBC. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Article 38 in this new law um, says that it applies even where the individual is neither a Hong Kong resident nor physically in the territory. How does this use of universal jurisdiction fit alongside international law, where it's kept normally for the most serious of crimes? And how can journalists, activists and others be sure that they're able to continue exercising their freedom of speech without being prosecuted if they set foot in Hong Kong? Uh, you know, uh, you mentioned about Article 38. Uh, that is a common practice. You know, even by British law, uh, that uh, uh, for those who commit a crime, 
uh, uh, who work against the interests of UK, uh, they should also be accountable, no matter where they are. You know, if they uh, uh, conduct uh, uh, activities in danger of British uh, national security, either it's uh, inside the UK or outside the UK, they will be held responsible. Uh, they have to be held accountable. And so they, there's, uh, I, I don't think there's nothing new in the national security law uh, 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 in safeguarding uh, 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 Hong Kong security. Uh, with regard to journalists, I think the law is very clear. It uh, uh, you know, uh, outlined the four categories uh, of the crime against the national security uh, of, uh, 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 of China. As long as a journalist abide by the law, you should have nothing to worry about. You will conduct uh, your work, uh, as I also mentioned, that uh, human rights are fully respected. That not only apply to Hong Kong residents, that's applied to you know, uh, uh, every residence and uh, uh, the, uh, every people uh, working, living in Hong Kong. And uh, in, uh, that uh, uh, human rights include uh, uh, freedom of, of uh, press, uh, you know, freedom of speech. So there's nothing to be worried about as long as you abide by law. Thank you. Uh, the next question, Deborah Haynes from Sky News. Hi, thank you ever so much, Ambassador. Um, the UK government is looking again at the decision of allowing Huawei into the UK network. If it decides that it's actually going to U-turn on that decision and not allow Huawei anymore into the 5G network, what impact will that have on UK-China relations? And if I may, you said that, the UK, that, that China does not interfere with UK affairs, and yet some people would disagree with that and say that China is actually conducting sort of subversive activities, trying to influence um, elements of UK politicians and uh, academia and even business to further its, in, its influence and interests. How do you respond to that? I would... Uh... I totally reject uh, any acquisition uh, interference in UK's internal affairs. I've been ambassador here for uh, more than 10 years. Uh, I never come across any incident that would be excused by UK government, by any you know, uh, uh, institutions with the hard evidence of China's interference into UK's internal affairs. If you have evidence, please show me, but do not make uh, disinformation, uh, false accusation against China. As I said in my uh, opening remarks, China uh, has fully committed uh, to international, the basic norms governing international relations. That has been our consistent policy um, with regard to Huawei, I spent a lot of time. I, I wrote many articles, made many speeches on Huawei. I don't think we have enough time to talk about that. The only I want to be brief on Huawei. That is, uh, Huawei is a win-win example uh, for China-UK collaboration. Uh, we believe that to embrace Huawei, to include Huawei, is not in the interest of China. I think it, it, in the fundamental interests of UK. I think uh, British government have this ambitious uh, plan to have a 5G uh, full coverage, coverage of UK by 2025. I think Huawei can do the job. But if UK choose to pay a high price for poor quality, or, or mean less uh, uh, quality, I, I, I hate to say, I'm sorry to use the word poor quality, it's up to you. You know, I, I always say we have to work for the best and prepare for the worst. Um, I, Huawei has been um, ha had operation in uh, 170 countries, and no country can have a proof, evidence, that they have this black door uh, uh, practice. And they have been very transparent. Transparent. They set up a uh, 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 center for analyzing their products, and is completely 
managed by British people, no any people from Huawei. They have a confidence. You know, no company throughout the world, you can give, a, give me a name. Do you have any other company except Huawei to set up a center to exempt themselves by a hosting country? No. So they have nothing to fear. If you, uh, you, know, you, you, you do not want Huawei, it's up to you. I always say that one door shuts, the other door opens. In China, we have saying, when the West turns dark, the East will be more brighter. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I heard there's a lot of a fuss and noise about Huawei, but we have nothing to fear. And I, I told our business people, business community here, you know, you have to be more confident. I think once you have a good product, you should not be worried about. They do not have a, a, a market. So I think the world is big enough to accommodate Huawei. You know, I really believe having Huawei is a win-win. It's not only for Huawei, but also for the UK. But of course, you know, at the end of the day, it's up to the British government. We have tried our best to tell the story of Huawei, but we cannot control the, the end of a British government decision. I heard there's a lot of uh, 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 speculations and, and uh, you know, we are ready. We are ready to any scenario, any consequences. I think Huawei will survive. Huawei will prosper. You know, no more pressure. The, you know, from so-called superpower, the more pressure from its allies, I think the Huawei will grow stronger. That is my prediction. The next question, um, Mark Champing from Bloomberg, please. Uh, yes, Ambassador, thank you. Um, just to very briefly follow up on the Huawei question. Uh, if it is, um, any decision is taken by the UK government, it's quite clear that it will be based on security concerns uh, rather than commercial, uh, uh, the kinds of commercial issues that you've outlined. Um, it's also quite clear that the uh, United States' concern about Huawei is to do with security. Uh, is what you are saying is that China doesn't see it as a security issue at all, and it wouldn't be concerned uh, that uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a political level that the UK would make such a decision. I think it's up to the UK to make a final decision um, in terms of security. I think Huawei have done their best to address the concern of the security uh, as, as uh, in addition, you know, um, you know, when you talk about security, um, are you talking about the security from the political perspective? You know, there is many security. You know, the one is come to telecommunications, you are secured, whether the technology is safe enough, resilient enough, to protect you, not only from a so-called, you know, uh, 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 state, but also from uh, 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 some hackers, individual hackers, or from some other companies. Um, so uh, you, you, you cannot uh, generalize security. One, but Huawei have made every effort to address the security concerns. As I said, they try to improve uh, their technology and the uh, intelligence um, uh, agencies, and they made their analysis that the risk is manageable uh, and, and the uh, technology in general is safe. That's why the British government made decision to include Huawei, though they have a 35% cap. But at the end of the day, if they decided you know, to give up Huawei, it's up to them. I, I think there's, uh, as I said, the world is big enough to uh, accommodate Huawei. They have, a, they, uh, they have operation in 170 countries. If UK gave up, they still have 169 countries. You know, I, 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 I try to encourage the people in Huawei, you should look forward. First, you have to work, you have to convince uh, the UK uh, partners, UK people, uh, either it's a government, a business, that you have the best technology 
and uh, your price is uh, uh, most competitive and you can address their concern, you are keeping improving your technology. You are the leader, but if they choose not, if they decide not to choose you, it's up to them. You have to, you still have to develop. You know, Huawei has been developed despite so many measures, so much measures. I have a con full confidence in them. So uh, uh, you mentioned about the security. And there's also uh, a, a point I want to make. You know, when I heard British politicians mention about Huawei, they link Huawei with the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the relation uh, with China. Some of them regard China as a threat, even at a hostile country. I think that's a totally wrong. You know, uh, that is uh, not inconsistent with the consensus reached by our two leaders, our two countries. You know, uh, one president, she was here. You know, many people talk about this golden era. You know, they, they, they have no idea what the golden era is about. This golden era was proposed by the British side was proposed by the British leaders. But we think it's in the interest of the two countries. Then we agree to the description, description of relationship as a golden era. But if you do not want a golden era, if you treat China as enemy, I think it's completely wrong. It's not in your interest. That reminds uh, Brzezinski, the American strategist, who have to uh, uh, normalize relationship between China uh, and the United States. Uh, and he himself uh, ha ha participated. I happened to participate in uh, the, this uh, process of normalization between China and the United States. Brzezinski have a very fine line by saying, if we make China an enemy, China will become an enemy. So we want to be your friend. We want to be your partner. But if you want to make China a hostile country, you have to bear the consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, next question, uh, Catherine Phelps from The Times, please. Um, hello, Ambassador. I wanted to know if there would be any attempt uh, to prevent... Oh, hello. Uh, I wanted to know if there'd be any attempt to prevent Hong Kong uh, holders of British national overseas status from taking up Britain's offer to come to the UK. Um, you know, we, we heard uh, quite a lot uh, talk about uh, to um, um, revoke British position uh, on uh, uh, the BNO. You know, uh, uh, when we reached the agreement uh, uh, in 1984, uh, a British government promised uh, in the exchange of MO that they will not citizens, but they decided uh, uh, to uh, revoke their position. And as I said, we regard it as a, a walk away from their international obligations. Um, people talk about China's response to it. First, our first response is we, we criticize a British move. We don't think they have honored their commitment. Secondly, we think it uh, interferes into China's internal affairs. I think this is a political manipulation against this national security law uh, for safe, uh, you know, in Hong Kong. And thirdly, we have to wait and see. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, we, we have to decide our countermeasures in accordance with the actual actions uh, to be taken by the British side. Uh, next question, Laura Hughes from FT. I, I can't hear you. 
，等会儿回来，拜访。Sorry, I cannot hear. I cannot hear a word of you. Maybe we'll come back to you. Yeah. We'll see. We'll try again. I'm sorry. Uh, uh Laura, we'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, should we now go to um, Matthew Ho Hohas, the Economist, please? Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador, could I ask you, please, to elaborate on what the uh, consequences for the UK in response to its position on Hong Kong may be? For example, and specifically, do you foresee consequences for British companies operating in the Chinese market? Uh, for bilateral trade, and if so, uh, in what sectors in particular? Uh, do you see, for example, of the freedoms of, of British banks or for companies serving consumer industries to operate in China? Thank you. Uh, you know, as I said uh, in my opening uh, remarks, that uh, relationship, uh, uh, state relationship, have to be based on basic principles, uh, respect each other, uh, respect for sovereignty, territorial integrity, non-interference uh, in each other's internal affairs, and respect the core interest and major concerns of each other. That has been reaffirmed by our top leaders. You know, uh, during the uh, pandemic, uh, President Xi and the Prime Minister uh, Johnson had a two telephone conversations. Uh, they both uh, reaffirm their commitment uh, to these basic uh, principles. But when you have these uh, principles uh, violating, they certainly have uh, consequences on the relationship. The mutual trust will be weakened. The confidence will be weakened. So, uh, uh, but with regard to specific uh, consequences on specific areas, we have to wait and see. We do hope that UK side will start by the uh, general interest, the fundamental interest between China and UK. We'll have a big picture of the fundamental interest of the relationship. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, next question, Gui uh, Tao from Xinhua News Agency, please. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, a recent survey has found that the uh, UK has, for the first time, overtaken the United States as the most popular destination for the Chinese students. So will China's attitude or policy regarding the Chinese students starting in the UK change if the uh, Sino-UK relations are further dented by uh, political issues? Thank you. Um, we certainly would like to see normal relations uh, between our two countries. Uh, will move forward, including our uh, 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 exchange of uh, students. Uh, you know, um, as I, I also read the, uh, some report that because of uh, what, is what is going on in the United States, uh, there's uh, more demand among Chinese students uh, for studying uh, in the UK. We welcome this. We encourage more Chinese students uh, coming here. Uh, the education section of the embassy has been very busy in providing information, in answering questions and queries of uh, Chinese students. We help them, uh, you know, to get in touch with the various universities. Uh, but right now, I do not see uh, the negative consequences on the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, education uh, cooperation. During the pandemic, I, uh, you know, uh, we have now have a 200, uh, 200, 200, uh, 200,000 Chinese students here uh, study in the UK. Uh, during the pandemic, I wrote letters to president and vice chancellors of 154 universities, which host the Chinese students. Uh, in addition, asking them to take care of, uh, to take good care of Chinese students. 
I also express my commitment to a stronger relationship between China, China their respect, their respect. universities. Thank you. Hmm? Uh, um, um, just following on some of the other points, um, you have um, Britain looking again at Huawei, you've got the British government talking about introducing new laws on foreign takeovers, which looks to be specifically aimed at Chinese firms. Um, you spoke earlier about uh, talking about the golden era. From China's point of view, is the golden era over between the two countries? And if it isn't, what does Britain need to do to uh, keep it going? As I said, that golden era is an idea uh, proposed by the UK side and uh, uh, endorsed by both sides. Whether it's over or not, I certainly hope not. But whether it's over or not, it's not up to Chinese side. Uh, I think during the pandemic, we still heard uh, the British leaders uh, express their commitment to the golden era. So uh, we certainly, you know, what I always say, any kind of relationship, you need two to tangle. You need two, two, two hands to clap. So um, I, I do hope that uh, relationship will uh, further develop, uh, will enjoy steady growth in the best interest uh, of the two countries. But as I said, it's up to the two sides. We have every reason to have a good relation with the UK. And we regard UK as a partner. We never use the word that UK is a potentially a hostile country. You never heard this word from any Chinese leaders, from any officials. So I really want to remind the British leaders, British officials, how they characterize. They have to be careful with regard to how to characterize the, the nature of the relationship. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. Next question, uh, Patrick Winter from The Guardian, please. Ambassador, uh, you mentioned that uh, the security laws are very popular in Hong Kong. You said there's three million people have signed this petition. But as you know, there were district elections last year which showed the democracy movement doing very well. Can you guarantee that elections that are due this autumn will be held on the same basis as the ones that were held uh, like the district council elections? And it will be the same freedom of expression and freedom to stand and uh, uh, freedom to campaign. Um, you know, we have a different interpretation of what is going on in Hong Kong. Uh, you regard it as a pro-democracy movement, but we think there's a violence, uh, the rioters, law-breaking activities, even terrorists. Uh, I, I don't think uh, pro uh, when you have a people uh, storm uh, the UK parliament, you regard them as a pro-democracy movement. When you have uh, the people, you know, we, we've seen uh, so many things happening in the streets of London in the past few weeks. I never read that uh, uh, the British media described them as a pro-democracy movement. You regard them as a lawbreakers, rioters, but why, when it's come to Hong Kong, you have a different standard. So I think there's a totally double standard uh, uh, approach. Uh, um, and uh, uh, you, with regard to the, um, election in September. I think the election will be conducted in accordance with the law in Hong Kong. And, uh, 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 you know, when we, when we talk about national security law, the law will be implemented according to law. You know, uh, the, as I said, this law have uh, incorporated fully uh, both uh, the uh, take account into account of uh, comprehensive jurisdiction of central government and high degree of autonomy of Hong Kong. So Hong Kong people will administer their affairs. Nothing has changed as long as you do not violate 
the national security law. Hong Kong's you know, social system, legislative system, legal system will all remain unchanged. Nothing has been altered. You should have confidence in Hong Kong. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Next question, uh, John Mullen from the Daily Telegraph, please. Uh, morning, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Um, China talked about taking retaliatory measures if um, uh, the UK pressed ahead with a plan on passports and residency back in the UK, but were short on the detail. Can you offer any detail on that today, what might be taken? And can I also ask you about uh, another uh, issue? Um, Ofcom today will severely criticise CGTN uh, over its broadcast uh, involving a Briton, Peter Humphrey, saying uh, he was forced to uh, on air while uh, while under duress. Can you offer a comment on that, please? On the uh, piano, uh, as I think I answered the previous questions, uh, my answer will be the same. Uh, well, uh, we have made our position to the British side. We hope that they will reconsider their uh, uh, position uh, with regard to what the response China is going to make. Uh, we have to wait and see what will be the specific actions from the British side. Uh, with regard to CGT, and I think they already made a re rebut to the uh, acquisition of Humphrey. Uh, it is totally uh, uh, not based on fact, and I think they have made their position uh, very clear. Thank you. Next question, um, Richard Engel from NBC. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador, uh, you talked to how this new national security law doesn't violate the decades-old policy of one country, two systems, but that the spirit of that agreement of one country, two systems allowed a great deal of political and freedom of expression in Hong Kong. There are reports this morning that books are being removed from public libraries written by activists. There have been activists, you describe them as rioters and terrorists, uh, who have been detained. So my question is, is this the end of freedom of expression as people have known it in Hong Kong for the last several decades? Not whether it's a violation of the law or not. Not, not at all. Uh, Hong Kong people will be uh, protected uh, for the freedom of speech, uh, freedom of uh, press. And uh, uh, you mentioned about I, um, uh, some of the books. It really depends on what the book is about. If the book has a, a aim that uh, inciting uh, uh, secession, subversion, you know, that will be tantamount to a kind of crime. You have to read the National Security uh, uh, Act carefully. In UK, you know, um, according to your, uh, you have many laws uh, uh, governing uh, national security. If you voice opinion in support of a terrorism, hatred, you, that will be regarded as an act of a crime. Why UK, you can have this law that China cannot have a national security law uh, to you know, um, punish those who incite uh, secession, the version uh, uh, to incite the actions endanger the national security. I think this is a common practice. When you talk about uh, freedom of uh, speech, freedom of press, I think, as I said, this law will protect the majority, great majority of Hong Kong people to exercise their rights for freedom of press, you know, freedom procession, freedom of uh, demonstration, but you can't do things to endanger national security. It's only four categories of crime. 
you, 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 one, one, you know, there's a bound, you know, even with regard to the freedom of uh, expression, freedom of uh, speech, protected by the international uh, covenant, there's also a limit. You know, you can't do this at the expense of a national security, public order. It's clearly stimulated. I do recommend you to go back to read this uh, governance of political and civil rights international document. So people has nothing to worry as long as they do not, they abide by the national security law, as long as they do not cross the line prohibited by the national security law, they should be 100% free. They have, should have nothing to fear. So I hope, so that's the problem. You know, British media and American media too, they spread this, I would call it a scaremongering practice. You know, they demonize this law. That's totally wrong. I do hope they read the law carefully. There's a four category of a crime has been very carefully stimulated in a very detailed way. You know, as long as you do not cross the boundary, as long as you exercise your rights within limits protected by constitution, by basic law, by international covenant, you should have no problem at all. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, next question, Laura Hughes from Financial Times. Thank you very much, Ambassador. A lot of British businesses in mainland China and Hong Kong are worried about people. What would happen if the Hong Kong police were to request user data or assistance from those businesses and they were to refuse? I think Hong Kong police will carry out the national security law in accordance with law. Um, we had made, made uh, the law, the national security law made it very clear that the uh, law enforcement uh, people, including police, including the uh, uh, the people uh, working in the uh, uh, office of national security, uh, uh, national security based in Hong Kong, they have to abide by the law in China and also the law in Hong Kong. So I, I, I think the, uh, uh, the police uh, enforcement uh, uh, people will carry out the national security law according, in accordance with all laws on the ground. Thank you. Uh, next question, um, Fahmed Ahmed from RT. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, the Boris Johnson government, of course, is looking to give uh, millions of Hong Kongers citizenship to escape uh, Chinese rule. So why do you think the UK is so ready to give uh, citizenship to Hong Kongers, of course, a former British colony, but not to other former British colonies, such as maybe Iraq, which, of course, suffered an illegal war in 2003? I think some of the politicians in um, UK still have uh, this very strong uh, colonial mindset. They fail to recognize that Hong Kong is no more under British colonial rule. Hong Kong has been returned to China long since for the past 23 years. So that's their problem. So that's why they have this passion. They have this colonial mindset. They still regard Hong Kong as under British colonial rule, rule and try to make a, uh, response, uh, irresponsible re remarks, try to interfere Hong Kong affairs, but that's totally wrong. I think they failed to realize that Hong Kong is now part of China. That's number one. Secondly, they fail to realize that stability and prosperity of Hong Kong is not only in the interest of China, it's also in the interest of the UK. 
the UK has uh, 300,000 uh, uh, citizens living in Hong Kong, and they have uh, seven, more than 700 businesses in Hong Kong. So prosperity, stability of Hong Kong is in their best interest. That's why, you know, I'm talking about 3 million people in Hong Kong signed the petition to support the National Security Council. That included major British business people from HSBC, Swear, uh, Jardin, you know, from Standard Charter. You know, the, those some politicians try to criticize them. That's wrong because they believe that stability and prosperity in Hong Kong is in their interest. You can't do business. You can't, you know, live a normal life without a peaceful environment. Look what happened last year. Can people, people do not even dare to walk in the streets under this so-called black terror. So people cry for chaos to end as quickly as possible. So that's how that the, the birth of the National Security Act. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. We have time for last two questions. Um, the next is Gary Gibbon from Channel 4, please. Thank you, thank you. Ambassador. Um, can I just go back to the issue of Huawei and ask you to spell out, please, what, do you, what are the consequences for Britain if Huawei is removed from 5G here? And would you consider that a hostile act? Um, the consequences, uh, that there might be many. First, it damaged Britain, Britain's image as an open, business-friendly, free environment, transparent environment, as they claim to be. So that's why in the past five years, the Chinese business in UK is bigger than the Chinese investment in the previous 30 years. Because Chinese business people believe UK is more business friendly. They can do business here. But when you get rid of Huawei, it sent out a very wrong message. It punished the British image as a free business, a free trade country. That's number one. Number two, that punish your image as a country which can conduct independent policy. Means you succumb, succumb to a foreign pressure. You know, you can't make your own independent foreign policy. I always say Britain can only be great when they can have their independent foreign policy. If you do not have an independent policy, you have to dance to the tune of the other countries. How could you claim to be a great Britain? Thirdly, I think it also sent out a very bad message to China uh, business community here. They're all watching. They're all watching how you handle Huawei. You know, that will be, if you get, get rid of Huawei, it sent out a very bad message for other Chinese business. It may also send out a bad message for other foreign business. And fourthly, there's also an element of trust. You know, when you have a sound relationship, it has to be based and built on mutual respect and mutual trust. In China, we have saying, you can't change your policy, you can't make your policy in the morning, then change it in the evening. How could, how could people trust you? So uh, I, I think it would be difficult. Uh, it's a matter of trust here. So um, I, I do hope that the uh, British government will make decision in the best interest. Not only in China's interest, not only in the interest of China-UK cooperation, but also in the interest of itself. Thank you. Uh, this question has taken longer than I expected, but uh, since I have agreed to ask another one, so uh, could I invite uh, Bao Yihan from China Daily to ask the last question? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. 
Um, some people think that the inclination of the national legislation for Hong Kong yeah. Yeah. Fine, no, also, will also help protect Great. British investment and the legal rights in Hong Kong. Mr. Ambassador, what is your opinion? Thank you. Absolutely. You know, I believe that, I, I, I think I answered your questions in my uh, previous answers and remarks. You can only do business in a peaceful uh, environment, stable and peaceful. So that's, that's why uh, this um, uh, uh, national security law is welcome, not only by the ordinary people who, you know, are very concerned about their security, but also by the the business people, business community, big business, not only British business, but also many other business. I read that uh, uh, there's, there's a report that uh, American Chamber of Commerce expressed their confidence in Hong Kong, that because this national security law can guarantee a business environment for the British people. So I do hope that uh, uh, British public, including British media, should read, should approach this national security law from uh, objective, uh, correct, accurate approach. Do not try to demonize this law. This law will provide a guarantee, a protector for safety prosperity of Hong Kong. As I said in my opening remarks, I think with the safeguards of the national security law, Hong Kong will become a safer, better, a more prosperous place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for today's press conference. Um. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, that's the end of today's uh, press conference. Thank you.